Hey, what's good, everybody? You already know what time it is. You already know what day it is. It's another SI Podcast Live. Uh, how's everyone doing? Hope everyone's doing good. Uh, it's another week of quarantine. Who knows the day? Uh, who knows which day it is, which number? I don't do those things. I don't count. <clears throat> We're all staying hydrated, cool, all that stuff. Uh, we have a lot of stuff to talk about. So... I'm just going to dive right in. I'm sorry. Forgive the dripping of sweat. Uh, I just got out of the shower. And I'm just going to make sure it was fresh for y'all. Because, you know, can't be sitting here at home in your filth. <laughs> All right. So, yes, we have a lot of things to talk about today. I want to make sure that I get everything covered in this hour. So, yeah, let's dive in. Uh, first things first. I found this video online of this couple talking about the things that they do for each other in a relationship. And they go back and forth and they talk about things being 50-50. Now, I want to watch this video and then I want to react to it. So, uh, this couple, once again, they made this video about things being 50-50. We're going to watch the video now and then we're going to respond. So, let us dive right in, shall we? All right, so yes, um, these people made a video on TikTok. And here they are. Let's check it out. If I pay for lunch, then I'll pay for dinner. If I buy the movie tickets, then I'll buy the snacks. If I get her something she likes, then she might get me something I like. And if he's having a rough day, I'll come help him out. Everything is 50 50. So don't expect to be treated like a queen whilst you're not treating him like a king. Period. Period. Jay and Laura with a relatively hot take of the day now this couple talks about everything being 50 50 right they talk about you know if i do this then you do that if i uh if i buy popcorn you buy the soda if you buy a meal i'll buy the appetizer i don't know i mean there's a lot of a lot of back and forth end of the day uh they emphasize that everything should be 50 50 if you don't treat your partner the same way that you want to be treated then nothing's going to work now that should be true. It is true. But at the same time, it's just like there's some things in a relationship that aren't always going to be 50-50, right? Um, there are going to be some things that... I'm sorry, I'm sweating a little bit. There are going to be some things that you're going to have to divvy up on, divide, right? It's not always going to be a give and take, an equal give and take, right? Um, there's some women in relationships that feel like the man should handle all the finances and in turn they handle like all of the domestic things right and i guess that's a level of 50 50 but you know for example uh, <laughs> a friend of the show uh miss walker uh shout outs to her uh she feels and she's very adamant about not splitting the rent right that's the big that's her that's like if she was if she was running for president <laughs> that would be one of her like that would be one of her stances one of her platforms, that no woman should be splitting rent with a man. And that's a good example of 50-50. In the same turn, it's not a matter of everything being 50-50, but certain responsibilities being split up between the guy and the girl, right? I feel that there should be an equal level of give and take. There should be an equal level of effort put into the relationship. Uh, but not everything is going to be 50-50. Some things are going to be 75-25. Some things are going to be 80-20. It, it, it all depends on the structure of the relationship and what you two are able to handle, right? Now, the things that they listed in this video were very small and minute. Like, oh, you, you know, rub my back and I'll rub yours. And as I said, you buy popcorn, I'll buy the snacks, some shit. You know, these are very arbitrary things, but on the grand scheme... You know, there are certain aspects of a relationship that's not always going to be that simple to break down. And I think it's important that people in a relationship or people working on a relationship understand those boundaries and make sure to do the right thing in settling, like, hey, all right, you know, moving forward, I'll handle this, you handle that. Or, you know, classic example of going out to eat, right? Uh, not always uh, is the case that people want to split the bill. I think that sometimes the guy should cover the bill. There should be times that the, the woman covers the bill. It all depends on the conversation and how um, 
each pe each person feels in that moment. But if you make the assumption that one person should do uh, this one task all the time, and it's not discussed, where it's like, all right, there's an equal level of give and take, where it's like, all right, I did this last time, can you handle this for me? And when there's a scenario where one party can't um, handle something, then the other person feels like, well, what are you good for? And, um, you know, I mean, there, that's a scenario where that can happen, not always the case, but there are some scenarios where one partner is expecting the other to do something and when they can't deliver because of whatever reason, that turns into a problem. So, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it comes down to communication, it comes down to a discussion. But if you feel that things in a relationship should be 50-50, then I'm curious to see how that works practically, right? Uh, for me, I just know that that's something that is not as easy as these people in this video make it seem. Let's watch the video one more time, uh, and then we can move on. But I just want to emphasize the things that they're stressing about, or I guess they're talking about. If I pay for lunch, then I'll pay for dinner. If I buy the movie tickets, then I'll buy the snacks. If I get her something she likes, then she might get me something I like. And if he's having a rough day, I'll come help him. Everything is 50 50. So don't expect to be treated like a queen. Whilst well, you're not treating him like a king. Period. So and you know what else about this video? That Now that I'm looking at it over, I don't like the way that it emphasizes that. The woman has to be subservient in a way to the guy equally. Like, it makes it seem like, oh, the guys do everything. And if the woman's not giving back, then it's not a good relationship. Like, like they said at the end, you know, don't expect to be treated like a queen if you're not going to treat him like a king. And it's just like, but in there's many scenarios where women are doing more of the heavy lifting than the men. So why is this narrative being painted that, oh, well, the guy does everything and the woman's just seemingly sitting back and receiving everything, right? That's what the, that's what the context of the video is showing to me, that it seems like there's a, a woman sitting back, the guy's doing everything, and now this couple is stressing like, oh, don't expect to be treated one way and don't treat the person the other way because that's not how it works. You know, he buys lunch, I buy it. <laughs> All right. I mean, I guess. I don't know if that's that serious. There might be some days where one person buys all the meals and then another day that the other person does. It, I don't think it really has to be an extreme split down the middle situation like this couple is making it. That's just my opinion. I don't know. Anyway, let's move on to the next topic at hand. Hmm. So there is a, for those who are familiar with Reddit, there's a thread on Reddit called AITA, which means, am I the asshole? And it talks about different scenarios where I guess people submit their questions to this uh, forum and they talk about like, hey, was I an asshole for doing this or an asshole for doing that? And this particular story is <laughs> very interesting. So I'm going to read through the whole thing, and then I'm going to talk about my reaction, right? Because, I mean, this is a very perfect example of a very wild story, All right? So I am going to flip the screen, and I'm going to read it, and then we're going to discuss. Okay. Am I the asshole for not wanting to kick out my brother despite my girlfriend's protest? Okay. My girlfriend and I have been dating for three years now. She's a dark-skinned black woman, and although I find her beautiful, my extended family members do not. My family is reasonably progressive, despite growing up in an extremely racist setting. In June, my brother and his son came to stay with us because he couldn't stand the coronavirus is a myth talk that was happening back home. My brother has always been financially independent, and he's always making good money talking over the fam taking over the family business. So I didn't think that he was leeching off me. He's going through a tough time with the the mother of his children, of his child, suddenly leaving him, leaving their son with him. I didn't mind opening my house up to him. Okay. My brother and my girlfriend have an odd relationship. My girlfriend claims my brother fetishizes black women because, according to her, he's repeatedly 
He repeatedly said some offhand comments about how he loves to watch ebony pornography, how he always tugs on her hair as if they were having sex, how he always makes a comment when she wears shorts, etc. Okay. My brother has always been big on compliments. He compliments her often, yes, even when she's in shorts. But the inappropriate comments she might be referring to could be his crude sense of humor. His comments don't bother me in the slightest, and I've never seen him, quote unquote, perving on my girlfriend. I know my brother has weird kinks and fetishes, but I can't imagine that he has a fetish for an entire race. I love my girlfriend, but I do not think she's particularly fond of my brother, and she's searching for justification to kick him out. My girlfriend thinks my brother's careless, and the whole fetish thing, I don't think he is somewhat careless as my, my girlfriend seems to take care of my nephew more than he does. But I also sympathize, sympathize, sympathize with him. It must be so hard watching the mother of the child walk out on you. We were having a beautiful dinner and my brother was talking about how unfortunate it is that we can't drive to the beach out because of COVID. And I don't remember the exact phrasing he used. He said something along the lines of, it's a shame your girlfriend can't model her new swimsuit for you. I laughed, but my girlfriend was very upset and voiced her opinion while she was putting the child to bed. She didn't explicitly say kick him out, but she alluded to it, trying to make excuses after excuses about why he shouldn't stay with us any longer. I told her she was being overdramatic and that I'm not kicking my family out. I know that she's mad at me, even though she wouldn't dare admit it. I don't think I have done anything wrong, but I do know that she's been taking long walks along the park with my nephew. So, am I the asshole? All right. Hey, for for those who are just joining, what's good? I just read a whole forum. Um, I just read this question uh, from this Reddit forum uh, called "Am I the asshole?" And this, just to sum it up, uh, for those who are just getting in here, uh, a brother emphasizes that his brother. Uh, was displaced from his home or wherever he lives. So he came to live with him and his girlfriend for a uh, time allotted or for however much long. Uh, the girlfriend says that the brother seems to fetishize her because she's a dark-skinned woman and she feels very uncomfortable with some of the comments that he's been making. Uh, the last comment that he made was that, you know, they live close to a beach and the brother says, hey, it's a shame that your girlfriend couldn't model off her new swimsuit for you, right? Making a very cheeky comment about uh, his girlfriend, and the girlfriend feels away, so she does not want the, the brother to be there, despite the circumstances of why he's there. Uh, so uh, the person who submitted the question is asking, am I the asshole for allowing my brother to stay with me and my girlfriend when my girlfriend feels uncomfortable with him and his comments. Now, one of the some of the big themes here, right, is um, he says here, my girlfriend claims my brother fetishizes black women because according to her, he's repeatedly said some offhand comments about how he loves to watch ebony pornography, how he always tugs on her hair as if they were having sex, how he always makes a comment when she wears shorts, etc. So, right. So, this brother is already making the girlfriend uncomfortable in the regards of his comments towards her, right? And now she's like, yo, yo, your brother, I'm not, I'm not cool with that. I, I don't like that shit. And she's not saying that directly, but I'm pretty sure the person that wrote this question or wrote this story has a sense of how the, how the girlfriend feels. Excuse me. So, yes. I mean, the answer is, is the person who wrote this, is he the asshole for allowing his brother to stay with them and him pretty much making very offhand comments to his girlfriend? I would say yes. Despite that being your brother, that's not cool. That's not okay. Like, you got to check your brother. You, you, what? This is always the case. It's like you are in a scenario where it's family versus your partner, right? And you always give your family the benefit of the doubt because obviously it's your family, all that. And when your partner is like saying some shit like, yo, I'm not cool with what they said or you know I'm saying, I don't like the way they came at me. Then it's just like, oh, you're just being overdramatic. Oh, that's not what he means. Because as a family member, you have a bias, right? There's a bias there that you know this person and you just know like, oh, that's just how they are. That's just, this is how they are. You know what I mean? And you try to sweep 
all their inappropriate behavior under the rug and you don't address it. So you're now, you're now feeding into that person's behavior and you're not checking them. If your partner feels a way about your family and how they address them, you have to be the person to check them, right? No matter if they're your mother, your brother, cousin, all that shit. Like, it doesn't matter. You have to be the one responsible to say, yo, like, my girlfriend's not cool with the comments that you're saying. And if you don't check it, you've got to be out of here. And that's, that's really what the conversation needs to be. Granted, people are scared to have these conversations or they're not exactly uh, jumping to have these type of conversations with their family in this type of scenario where the brother was staying with them for some time because they don't want to make things awkward. They don't want to make things comfortable. Once again, that's their, that's their sibling. So it's just like, if I do say something, it's going to seem like I'm doing too much. But no, this in this case, once again, uh, the guy who wrote this is an asshole. Both of them are, right? You know, you're allowing your brother to say these things to your girlfriend. Your girlfriend doesn't feel cool about it, and then you're pretty much gaslighting her. The gaslighting part. Let's look at the gaslighting part. Gaslighting part is right here. It says here, right, once again, uh, I'm going to read it for y'all. Gaslighting, never okay. We're, ha we're having a beautiful dinner. Brother was talking about how fortunate it is that we can't drive to the beach. He, sa he says something along the lines of, you know, it's a shame your girlfriend can't model her new swimsuit for you. I laughed. Girlfriend was very upset. She didn't explicitly say kick him out, but she alluded to it, trying to make excuses of the excuses. I told her she was being overdramatic and that I'm not kicking my family. Well, that guys. Hey, sorry, uh, someone's calling. I had to give him a text. So, yes. Uh, so, all in all, you know, that level of gaslighting is not okay. And, yes, this brother is an asshole for allowing his brother uh, to pretty much degrade his, his girlfriend, right? As I said, you have gaslighting, you have fetishizing, you have all these things. And if you as a family member can't check your family in that regard, then, yeah, yeah, they're not your family. I mean, they're still your family. But it's like, yo, you did too much. That's not okay. I can't imagine, I don't think I've ever been a, in a situation where my family's like disrespected my partner and I had to check them. There was only, well, there was one. But to be fair, this particular girlfriend was, ugh. <laughs> like, uh, so, but no, there was actually a point, like, in, in the beginning of that relationship, I would defend her actions because she came off very, what's the word? She came off very shy, very antisocial, you know what I mean? Very introverted. And, you know, I call it the, the WB uh, frog effect, where it's just like, you know, when I was with her, she was animated, she was positive and bubbly and outgoing. And then when others came around, she was just very like, a bit quiet, silent. And everyone used to keep asking me like, what is wrong with your girl? And I'm just like, no, she's good. She's fine. This is just how she is. There's no problem. Alas, there was an issue, but that's not the point. The point is, you know, uh, if your family member or family makes your partner feel uncomfortable in any which way as it pertains to race or appearance or anything like that, you got to check your family. You can't gaslight your girlfriend, especially, or get girlfriend or boyfriend, especially if they're in a position where they feel uncomfortable. So don't do it. Don't be an asshole. And that is, that's the word there. Yeah. So anyway, uh, you know, so that's that story. Uh, what else do we have to talk about today? Oof. Let's get into the main topic, one of the main topics that I saw. Um, let's, let's think of some light and fluffy stuff. Have you guys heard that uh, Netflix is about to drop all of black 90s UPN uh, television on their platform later this year? Shit is lit. Uh, we have Girlfriends, Moesha. We have The Parkers. We have... One on one, we have all those shows coming to Netflix, and that's just a wave. And quite frankly, I'm excited. Um, 
Hey, speaking of, for those who might be 90 babies here, uh, what is what is some of your like 90s, uh, what were some of your like 90s traditions? Like, I know for me, like after school, I come home, I watch some Power Rangers, I do homework, and then I'm just like bullshitting for the rest of the day. I'm, I'm watching all types of cartoons, I'm doing all that stuff. And that's kind of pretty much the way my 90s was set up. For others, once again, all these shows that I just mentioned are part of their like childhood. You know what I mean? And and I just I just thought of this just just now. So you had shows like Moesha, right? You had shows like Duck, if you remember Duck, the Nickelodeon show. You had shows like Clarissa Explains It All, right? You had these type of shows where you had a pivotal character that was going through their teenage angst or whatever, and they would somewhat therapize with the audience in a way. By either like writing in a journal or talking directly to you, right? We don't have too much shows like that anymore, right? Like the '90s, low key was uh, a whole therapy session, right? Because they were talking to their audience about things that people in the demographic of who was watching was going through: relationships, oh, school, uh, their parents just not understanding, all these other things. And I think it's actually kind of dope that you have a show like Moesha, for example, where you had a young black girl writing in a journal, right? And talking about all the things that they were going through. You don't see that every day. You don't, I mean, we have such a stress on mental health right now, but we don't talk about, we don't talk about the, the emphasis of how like back in the day they used to emphasize that, right? It's so wild. Uh, <laughs> but I kind of made that connection just now. It was just like, you know, I know I, I had a journal, I will show you guys my journal. I'm not gonna read anything. In fact, should I should I read you all the entry? Um, so on my dunk shit, I had a journal back in the day. It was called See, see, big old composition, throwback, BJ's book, volume one. I was about to be a whole writer out here, son. Like I had I had look at this. This book covers from elementary school. I'm 17 years old. So when I wrote this, this is all the way... No, not even elementary school, sorry. This book covers from high school? High school to college. And the way I wrote in this book... <laughs> ooh, had some very spicy uh, entries. Um, oh, it's weird. You know... I mean, I currently still journal now, but it was like the first example of my journaling experience. And this book is kind of bittersweet because um, when I, like in these days, um, for those who do or don't know, um, my stepmom passed away a couple years ago. And back in the day, I did not like her very much. And in this book, I emphasized how much I did not like her. And... You know, unlike TV, where people uh, would respect a journal, uh, that's not the way things work in the Caribbean household. Uh, people say, see a book that says, for example, like, do not read uh, or, you know, turn back. And they proceed to read it because there's no privacy in a Caribbean home. So I ended up writing a whole bunch of things about my stepmom that I expressed, like, my anger and rage. And people read it, and then I was addressed about it, and then I had to go back and write all the things I was grateful about her for. And I remember that day, and it was such an emotional experience. And it was the first time I felt like I was a dick because, you know, I didn't appreciate that person in my life uh, until later on. But all that to say, um, journaling, or just that level of, of expressing that, especially back then, was, was something that I never, I took for granted, right? I took it for granted until recently. And to this day, I have a journal now, and I journal every so often. So I've been journaling for quite some time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, journaling or just like kind of checking yourself in that way is really important. So all that to say, you know, Moesha and those other shows are coming back. And yeah, uh, just the fact that low-key, the 90s was trying to tell us how to, how to check ourselves mentally. I mean, just never noticed it. Or I don't think most much people noticed it until I just kind of noticed it just now, at least. Yeah. So, 
All right, let's get to the main topic. Oh, man. Ooh, this is going to get me tight. So as most of you may or may not know, and if you haven't known, then living under a very huge rock, Megan Thee Stallion, and we talked about this in the last live, but Megan Thee Stallion uh, was shot in her feet. Uh, I, I don't even want to say allegedly, because, I mean, fuck, Tory Lanez. Uh, and she recently came on Instagram and talked about her experience. Now, funny enough, I was, like, the moment that I saw on my phone that she was going live, I was like, hey, stop going live. I follow her. She's a queen, a goddess, a whole, a whole woman. So I was just like, oh, no, I got to check this out. And I caught the actual live where she was talking about what she was going through, and she just wanted to make sure her, her followers knew that she was okay. And uh, we talked about in the last live that Drea made some comments about her on some joke shit, and, you know, Megan on Twitter was like, yo, this bitch thinks this shit is funny. Like, this is not funny. I was just so, right, Megan Stalin came on IG, and she talked about how, you know, she was okay, and she just wanted to, everyone to know that she was okay. She emphasized how, you know, basically the major takeaway was that people in the circle can't always be trusted. So you need to check the people around you. She got into the fact that, you know, she's still not over losing her mother and her parents. And that was, kind of, and that was emotional and all these things, right? It was a very short life, but it was very impactful too. And this was the first time that she spoke out after the incident, right? Like in person, like you could see her face. And the fact that people were making jokes about it to begin with, right? Fucked up. It's just, so, I mean, there's so much thoughts that, that go into it, right? First of all, you have the memification of Trump. And I have been struggling with the, I've been struggling with the notion of do black people use drop or do black people use comedy as a means of coping with like negative situations or are niggas out here just trying to cloud chase for some likes and retweets and some double taps. I don't know. Right. I know that it's usually leaning towards the latter towards the clout shit, but I think it depends on the situation. Comedy, comedy has a place, right? For example, like, okay, it's going to be extremely controversial. Pop Smoke, right? If it were the case that Pop were to have survived, I strongly feel that there would have been a whole bunch of memes, a whole bunch of jokes about, oh, Pop got, Pop got popped or some bullshit, and the internet would have taken that shit and rolled it into a fucking meme circus. But the fact that he did not survive, you didn't see no memes, you didn't hear any type of shit, and there's probably a bias because like he's a, he's a male rapper, you know what I'm saying? And people tend to cape more for male rappers than women rappers. Now I'm not, obviously I'm not here trying to say that Pop deserved whatever happened to him. Obviously not. Like that shit really affected me in a way. But in the same tune, heaven forbid, oh my God, heaven forbid, Megan would have been killed. And I'm not trying to speak that into existence. But let's say that shit was worse, right? Would there still been the jokes? Would there still been some level of key, key, key? You know what I mean? So you already have the memification of trauma. You already have black women being mistreated in a sense of how their worth is in a, in a social environment. You have all these, you have women, you have black women joking about other black women being put in, in a domestic violence situation because that's, that's what it was. It was it was a domestic violence situation. You have women like Drea and this other chick fucking just not hilarious, to be honest. I, don't, I never saw her as funny, but she recently came out with a video making fun of the situation. And I'm just like, why, why is it that we decide that black woman's trauma, in a sense, is a joke? Right? Now, I... No, part of me is just checking him to, all right, yeah, she survived, so we're just making fun of it because we're laughing through the pain. But, nah, I don't think niggas are doing this shit to laugh through the pain. This is not a laughing through the pain scenario. I think this is on some real vile shit. And, um, it's ridiculous. It's not, it's not, it's not funny. It's not cool. It's fucked up. It's fucked up. And I just know that I mean, look, women rappers are already 
treat it as low rung to begin with, right? They're pinned against each other. They're they're always being shadowed by their male counterparts. All this shit. But then this very situ this very real situation, very serious situation, being treated as a fucking joke, like. And it's, so majority of black men are making these fucking jokes. I've seen a, a whole bunch of memes about the shit. I'm looking at it, it's like, why the fuck is this supposed to be funny? And once again, I don't. Once again, I don't know if it's black people trying to laugh through the pain, or whatever. But this woman does not deserve to be made a joke of. Um, like she got fucking shot. Period. She got fucking shot. Why are we kikiing about it? Why are we making all these memes? And you know another thing. Speaking of fucking memes, Breonna Taylor. God rest that woman's soul. I really wish, and I will say this right here, right now. I wish that the officers who have killed that woman get their fucking get what they fucking deserve. But at the same time, and this was something that that came up earlier or came up a while ago, the fact that she has been created into a meme or turned into a meme. I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't get it. Now there was a, there was a point where people felt that her name was being uh, disappeared in the I guess ethos of social media, right? Like she wasn't trending as much. People were starting to forget her. So I know that for certain people, they felt like, oh well, I need to turn or I need to turn to creative waves to keep her name in people's mouths. I just I just uh, I feel a way about people creating or people using this woman's name as a form of, oh, I need to create a creative aspect to keep her, her name in people's mouths. Like, there was a dude that created a song about, you know, arresting the cops that killed Brown Taylor. I thought that was, that wasn't horrible, but it's still just like, do we have to make a song out of it? Then there was recently an uh, Instagram challenge where people were taking pictures of themselves in black and white, and then some people posted... Uh, Breonna Taylor's picture in black and white a part of the challenge. I'm just like, do we have to do that? Why can't we just emphasize, yes, you know, we are all in agreement that the the cops that killed Breonna Taylor should be arrested. But do we have to make this shit into a, a song, a meme, a fucking t-shirt, a fucking, I don't know, a fucking just weird paraphernalia? I, I don't know. It's weird. It's weird. I can't fathom I just can't fathom people treating this in any other way. And it's just like, why? Why? We could, we could, we can keep this woman's name trending without turning her into a trope. I think that's what it is. Black women, especially when they go through a level of uh, traumatic experience or when they're in a case of disjustice, are used as tropes, right? And not as causes. And that's fucked up. And I don't know why we as a culture accept that. We feed into it, right? We feed into that level of treating women, black women in this case, that go through traumatic experiences as a trope or as a meme or as something that's just kind of treated loosely. And, and I just don't, I don't like it. I don't like it. It, it doesn't sit right with my soul. Um, shout out to this uh, homeboy that uh, I follow on Twitter, uh, Decent. He tweets every day the amount of days that the cops that have not killed Brown and Taylor are still free, right? So every day he tweets the cops that, you know, uh, killed Brown and Taylor uh, not being arrested day 30, 130 something, right? And for me, it's like, okay, that's, that's a good example of keeping this woman's name alive without turning it into a fucking theatric, right? But people aren't doing that. And now Breonna Taylor has gone from innocent black woman who gets killed in her apartment to Breonna Taylor fucking hashtag meme, once again, trope. And now people are just throwing her in fucking conversations like, oh, you know, sex is great, but you know what's really great? the cops that killed Brown and Taylor needs to be arrested. Like, don't do that. And I'll admit, I was guilty of not memeing her. I think I fell into a meme. I fell into, not one of the memes, one of the tropes. I'll admit that I, I fell into it because I thought that I was doing my part to keep her name 
in people's mouths or keep her name trending. But I realized I was a part of the problem. And I deleted what I put. I deleted the thing that I wrote. And I, I just feel like we need to check ourselves when it comes to that. Like, we really need to check ourselves when it comes to using black women's traumas as a means of, of comedy or, or something that we take lightly, right? As I said, with Megan Thee Stallion, she could have been shot, 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 like on some, she's dead. And where would the jokes, where would the jokes have been then? And we're not talking enough about Tory Lanez. Why are we not talking enough about him? Because clearly he was there when the scenario happened. So why are we not talking about fucking canceling this nigga or dragging him to filth? Why are we focused so much on on Megan and what she went through? Right? Why are we not talking about that guy? I know some people are talking about it from what I've seen online, but why are we not talking about his role in this shit? People are like, oh, we're fucking Kylie Jenner or where fucking Jenner was there. And, oh, where was Kylie and all this? I don't give a fuck about that bitch. I don't give a fuck about her. I care, I, I care about Tory Lane's actions towards Megan. That's what I care about. And I don't know why people are treating this shit as a joke. I don't get it. People are weird. People are fucking weird. I just don't understand. I really hope that uh, Megan recovers. Uh, funny enough, uh, speaking of Drea from earlier, she actually lost her endorsement with Fancy Beauty. So you know Rihanna's not playing that type of shit, right? And that's the level of accountability or that's the level of uh, reacting to a situation like that that gets people what they deserve. You know, she lost her endorsement. That's it, right? And considering that Rihanna herself was a victim of a domestic violence uh, situation back with Chris Brown, she already is not going to play some type of shit where she's going to let that shit slide or let that shit gloss over. So I just feel that we need to do better when it comes to standing up for uh, black women in the regards of not using their trauma as something likely. Or, you know, one of the things that also happened in that live was that a lot of uh, people were emphasizing, like, oh, she's so strong, and she's so poised, and she's so put together. No. No, no, no. And you know what? Once again, I fell into this myself. I have fell into the trope of calling black women strong because they seem to have some level of emotional fortitude. And that's fucked up. It's fucked up. Because women, black women are not here to beat the strong brick walls, right? Black women go through a lot in themselves, and they need to express themselves. And I, and I put in the chat while the, the live was going on, it's like, yo, let her, let her show emotion. Let her cry. People are like, oh, no, don't cry, baby girl. Da, da. No. This is not even a matter of, oh, showing weakness and, oh, if you cried and the haters went. No, fuck that shit. She just went through a traumatic experience. Let the girl express herself, son. Let her express herself. It's not fair to, to, to pin the title of strong on her and not allow her the opportunity to go through what she's going through. It's not fair. It's not fair because they don't do that shit to men. Actually, wait. Did I do that shit to men? Well, men are already troped as, oh, well, nigga, you shouldn't be crying, right? So we already trope men into not expressing a level of emotion when it comes to trauma. But women, especially, especially strong women, we don't give that mercy to. We don't give that grace to. And as a result, they now have to hold in their pain for the sake of showing a, a strong face to everyone. And then the moment some shit does break them down, it's like, well, damn, it be a strong one, yo. You got to check in on the strong ones. No, no, there should be no checking in on the strong ones in the regards of, oh, now being retrospective about it. Check on your strong friends the same way you would check on your not so strong friends. I don't want to say weak. But you should be checking on anybody regardless of how you coin or how you how you see or your perspective of one person. Because some of us may face forward on face value, be, come off as strong, but those are some of the people that may be going through the, the most pain. So, yeah, I didn't like that. I didn't like that narrative either. And that's something that I had to learn for myself where it's just like, I don't, I shouldn't be just coining black women are strong. No, yes, black women are strong, yes. But when it comes to hiding a level of pain or, or trying to mask that level of emotional 
uh, expression, throwing that, that strong word in there should not be something that we do in order to quell uh, someone's someone's hurt, right? Now, granted, I know that, you know, most people didn't want to see her cry because, oh, girl, don't cry, please, and, you know, everything's going to be all right. I know that people are trying to, I guess, um, you know, put her at ease or it was a, a coping mechanism, but we can't do that all the time, right? These, Especially these celebrities, like, they're people too. And when they go through some wild shit, they deserve to express themselves however they want to. It's not fair that we, we put them in this box. It's just not. So yeah, that's all the things that I, I had to kind of talk about today. Uh, funny enough, I'm, oh, <laughs> see, Just Hilarious is actually turning on Twitter as I tweet this. Um, so once again, I was talking about how Just Hilarious made this video about uh, Megan Thee Stallion. And people are dragging her to filth. Jess Hilarious thinks she's so funny, but I think her ex Courtney Wayne is funnier, especially when he left her and went back to his wife and kids. Oop! Jess Hilarious is embarrassing and lame as fuck for reenacting Meg's shooting. Like, what part of it's not funny do y'all not understand? Black woman's trauma is not funny, and people shouldn't have to keep saying that. Correct. Jess Hilarious, so raggedy. Um, this was a video of a question. I'm not going to play the whole thing. Soon to be popular opinion, Jess Hilarious has never been funny. Big mood. Uh, I never thought her to be funny, but yes. Just to kind of close off that point of, you know, and and you know what it is? People like her who claim to be comedians are going to try to spin this on his head like, nah, man, y'all took it out of context. Uh, you know what I mean? Like that. <laughs> fuck, fuck you. Pretty much. Yeah, so I don't want to hear that bullshit. I don't. Uh, anyway, uh, that is about it for today's show. Thank you all for those who uh, came in, uh, to, you know, talk or to share or just look at me, look at my face. Um, appreciate y'all. Um, once again, uh, there's, uh, if you want to check in on all the new episodes or all the episodes thus far, um, I'm working on some new episodes coming up, but if you want to check out the past episodes, please go to either SoundCloud or Apple Podcasts, or Spotify, or Google Play, or your preferred podcast platform, and check out the latest episodes. You can check out the rest of the IG Lives on YouTube or on IGTV. Uh, you can send your questions. If you have any questions for the show, questions for me, uh, please send them to podcast at gmail.com. Uh, so next week is going to be a big announcement. Big announcement for next week. So please uh, join us for this live next week, August 5th. Or just join us for the next live. Uh, there's going to be some big news. So I just make sure to tune in. Big announcements uh, for things coming up. And I'm working, once again, I've been emphasizing in the past couple of lives, I'm working on some, some really good shit. So I want to make sure that all of you are aware of it. And there's going to be announcements, big displays of all that shit, but... Yeah, I'm working on some, some real dope shit. So I want to make sure that you all are in tune and aware. And uh, yeah, a lot of changes have happened these past couple of months. And I, you know, I'm going to have to kind of come forward and address them. I don't want to address them on this live, but I want to uh, just kind of put everything out on Front Street. So I'm thinking of maybe doing like a mini a mini episode next week just to explain everything and make the announcement and then go from there. So anyway, um, I'm going to wrap it up here. Thank you all for watching. And once again, make sure to check out the podcast, check out the latest episodes, uh, like, share, and I will see you all next time. All right. Peace.